We are in the Bond Fee Satin Performance Studio here in Denver, Colorado, in the AUVO Performance Studio. I'm Carlos Lando, joined by David Amram, the, the Renaissance man of American music who is back in our community once again to enlighten us musically and enlighten us spiritually uh, through his uh, words and his music. Uh, David, welcome back to, to Kubo, man. It's so good to see you. It's great to see you again, Carlos, and all the people here at Kuvo and all these great musicians I'm blessed to know these years on Play With and to see that jazz is a language that is being learned not only around the world, but right here in the USA and in Colorado. And the extraordinary success of the station proves that the music is here to stay and that we can hope a new generation can grow up feeling at home and comfortable with the treasures that actually were made right in this country. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll tell you, we have uh, one of the things uh, in, in, in listening to you over all of these years has always been that um, uh, you are such an inspiration for so many people. Uh, not just in this country, but all over the world, you you have a way of acclimating yourself, and 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 and, and just wherever you, as the old saying used to go, wherever you hang your head is your <laughs> hat is your home uh, uh, through music, and and, and to me, it's kind of like uh, uh, you know the respect, the love, the sharing, the things that you have always pointed out. Uh, and unfortunately, there's only one David Amram. If we had more, this world would be a better place. So, Well, thank you. I'm the product of thousands of people yeah. that helped me and still help me yeah. today yeah. to continue trying to improve and trying to have that spirit of sharing. Yeah. And this is something which is so important and so much the philosophy of what jazz as I've known it, a 93-year-old, when I knew it when I was a little kid, had just some special feeling, aside from the music being yeah. so beautiful. The people that I met who played it and loved it and listened to it and, enjoyed, and danced to it and sang it and enjoyed it all had that spirit and still have that spirit. Yeah. And that's something that hasn't been decimated. Wars, famines, politics, business, fine. However... The music still is on a level above all of us and is there for all of us, just like the changing of seasons. You look out and see those beautiful snow-covered mountains. What a mind blower. We didn't create that. That's created by a higher power, and music's part of that higher power, and all of us are here while we're here to serve that higher power. Yeah. Well, thank you, David. And if, as you were noting earlier, the fine musicians who are in the house with us uh, today to help uh, elevate all of this is wonderful. We have Mr. Hugh Reagan on trumpet. Uh, we have your son. It's the first time I've I've met him. Uh, being here, what? How do you pronounce your name? For Adam. Adam Amram. Of course, Tony Black on drums, and uh, Ron Bland on bass uh, with you. And uh, so these. What do you call it? The Rocky Mountain. Amram uh, <laughs> experience. <laughs> what are you going to start off with first? Yeah. Well, we thought we'd begin with a wonderful piece by Sonny Rollins, whom I met in 1955 when I was playing with Charles Mingus, and Sonny had just gone back from Chicago full of energy and good music, and he sat in with us all the time, and I got to know him play with him. And this was a song based on the folk music where his folks came from in the West Indies, St. Thomas. And listening on Kuvo Airwaves or anywhere, you don't have to go to St. Thomas to feel that you're there because the music always takes you to the place that it comes from. And this originally was something that Sunday learned I guess hearing his folks singing it and playing it and gifted us and it's become a jazz classic, a musical classic from Sonny Rollins' own beautiful spirit 
and mind that he created for all of us to enjoy and is called St. Thomas. So from Arapaho Avenue, or Arapahoe Street. Arapaho Street to downtown metropolitan St. Thomas, you can skip the plane fare, the frequent flyer miles, the inoculations, anything, and just take a trip because the music takes you right to where it comes from.
St. Thomas from uh, Sonny Rollins and this particular rendition from David Amram and Friends. We are in the Bonfi Stanton Performance Studio here at KUVO. I'm Carlos Lando. Thank you uh, for, uh, for tuning in. We appreciate it very much. Uh, Mr. Amram, the, uh, I was going to say the last time you were here, and I'm trying to remember when that was. That was pre-pandemic, I believe. <laughs> was the last time that uh, that it, it's kind of like the the world came to a uh, a stop in a lot of ways. But a lot of people discovered a lot of things about themselves and 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 their neighbors and other people. We had to all kind of listen to each other a little bit more. There was more time for re reflection and for looking ahead. I always remember that film. That came out about your your life, the first eighty, and then you last time you were here, you said, "I'm working on the second 80. I always remember. I always remember you telling me that, and so forth. So, but uh, you're looking great, and you 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 came out of that whole thing pretty good. Good well, experience. I've been very lucky. I'm lucky to still be here. Yeah. Lucky to play with Hugh Reagan and Adam Amram and Tony Black and Ron Bland. And be with you again, Carlos. In 1990, we met when the station was in Five Points <laughs> as a little activist station. And a great conga player, Jose, who's not with us no more, yeah. said, man, you got to come down and check these cats out. And I was at the University of Denver as the Leo Block Fellowship Artist for the Year. And I went down to this little radio station, and I was knocked out by the true international flavor, which meant it was human. And I kept going back there, and then I kept my rental car that the University of Denver was kind enough to let me have fixed to Kuvo Channel, and I didn't hear one thing the whole year I was there that I didn't love hearing, hearing great musicians I'd never heard of, musicians I knew of who was Records has never got played on the radio, right. and young people coming up and local bands. And I said, wow, this is why the radio was invented, to share priceless information in a community and reflect the community. And to see the station doing so well all these years and all of you still working as a part of it is very inspiring. And this is something that I learned to appreciate from the great Arthur Miller. I was lucky enough to stumble and fumble the way into being asked to play and create music for his first play, opening up the Lincoln Center Theater, 1964, in a production of After the Fall, a brand new play that he'd written. Ilya Kazan directed it. Wonderful cast of New York actors. And Arthur Miller really saw the sanctity of life and of all people, everyday people, because every single person except for Bigfoot, and we still haven't discovered this an everyday person, and <laughs> so there's no in and out, up and down group. Which play and, was that? The one? Uh, it, was, uh, it was called After the Fall. After the and Fall. And in it, he describes some of his own troubles and how he overcame them. Yeah. And it, just knowing him, being with him, yeah seeing that he never put himself above others, was just a real old-fashioned person. Uh, the kind of people that I met playing jazz who j opened up their heart and their mind if they saw you were sincere. So I, he was just someone that was a great mentor, not only being a wonderful playwright, but how to be act like a person and act like a human towards others. This was a little waltz that we've expanded over the years since it was written for the play. Otherwise, if it was as long as it is when we do it, I would have been thrown out of the theater the first week. But <laughs> we've had a chance to develop it, and we've played it here so many times. We always do it differently, and it's one of our theme songs for the last 20 years I've been playing with these wonderful musicians. And it's a pleasure to do it for you now in the brand-new, fabulous studio over here right on Arapahoe Street in downtown Denver. That's right. Seeing Kuvo is still here, music is still here, and Arthur Miller's play is still here, 
And the old recording we made with Pepper Adams and Jerry Dodge and myself and Candido and others is still here too. So John Keats got it right when he said, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. Waltz from After the Fall.
Thank you, David. Thank you to the, the, the musicians, as we are here in the Bonfee Stanton Performance Studio with David Amram and friends. You know, you, you've always felt uh, at home uh, through your music, anywhere in the world, because you, you're able to relate to so many different musical styles and so forth. I was always curious as to how is it that, that it doesn't take you long to ingratiate yourself to <laughs> in, into whatever is going on and, and whatever culture and, and th through through music what is it that you that that, that you're listening for initially because I mean you've sat in with 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 everybody is there something there that that uh, universally that 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 speaks to the ability to to to, to get into uh, into a session well it has to touch your heart by you, I mean anybody who's playing it or who's listening to it. And then you have to exercise a word which has almost disappeared from our vocabulary, but it always is the essence of how to enroll in the University of Hangoutology and be accepted as a scholarship student for life and is called respect. And when you respect the people who are doing it, and then you learn to respect their culture, and you realize that you might be born into something different, and you'll never know how it feels to be that person, but you can respect the beauty of their heritage, yeah. then find the beauty of your own heritage and respect that, then you no longer are colonized into feeling that you're worthless and that you come from a society of no culture where the very founders of our society, I should say the immigrants who came over here initially and got lost and thought they landed in India, uh, somehow were able to gain the respect of those folks who lived here for thousands of years who showed them, us and our forebearers, how to live together. The only thing is that we forgot how lucky we were to be landing on these shores. And when I spoke to Von Deloria, the great Native American writer and thinker and activist, he said, well, we don't mind. We don't be, have to be called indigenous or First Nations people or Native Americans. He said, we've always been here for a long time. and." Uh, it's lucky that Columbus didn't think he landed in Turkey, or they'd be called we'd be called turkeys instead of Indians. So we don't care about that. We care about the essence of the higher powers of nature and what we don't understand, which includes music, and the value of all music, all cultures, and all peoples. And when you arrive at that point, we no longer disrespect how your grandmother cooked, and you don't disrespect your own cultures. We, most of us were born into more than one culture. Then you can respect everyone else's culture and receive their understanding that you're there to participate and be part of the whole. That maybe you're coming to a place where they've been living for thousands of years, and you come to the realization They've been doing fine without me. And when you see that, then you can see all the beautiful things that are there. And if you're lucky enough, you can play with any musicians, with any kind of people in the world, every kind of people, because they're all people, people, and learn something and find that commonality through the, through the respect. There's also some magical words, which have also almost disappeared from our vocabulary, called please and thank you. Those are the very important <laughs> to learn every country you're in just to show that you know you're in someone else's country and you're trying to understand their beautifulness of what they've created and had created and passed on to them so they can pass on a little of that to you. That's a long-winded, falutin answer to your question. That's fine. But, but basically, <laughs> that's what it is. That's what has enabled me to learn the few things they have and 
the realization that part of the gig is to pass that on to others and make some person feel welcome and privy to the knowledge that they've received which they're passing on to you. It's not complicated at all. Yeah. And it's very important. Otherwise, you can go to schools, colleges, and be with the smartest people in the world. And you're still what they call in the South an overeducated fool if you don't realize the preciousness of music and the preciousness of the culture and the preciousness of life itself and people and the fact that we have to learn to respect one another. Yeah. So what have you chosen to pass along to us <laughs> now musically? <laughs> well, after that, I, I can tell you a long story, but then, then the program would be over. But when I worked with Ilya Kazan, who is an amazing person, when he was questioned of his politics, he said, well, you have to understand that my uncle entered this country by jumping off the boat because they knew they wouldn't accept him. He said, we never, I wasn't brought up feeling the world owed me a living or everybody was going to love me. So I had to learn to fall in love with America. And the film he did, Splendor in the Grass, he said, after we had done it, he said, you know, people in 1960 might think this is corny, but I think it's telling a story of how men and women really had a hard time when I was a kid growing up and, and, and falling in love and, and having a, caring for one another. And I had a chance to write the music for this wonderful film that he did. And we even had some terrific actors and jazz artists come and perform in the soundtrack and also be in the film. Buster Bailey, the great clarinetist, not only played the most magnificent solos, but also appeared in the film. And I did too with Maurice Perez, the conductor, for a few seconds. And mostly, all these years later, it's still nice to do. It was, and I orchestrated it as I did all my own music for a symphony. And the symphony couldn't make it to Kuvo Studios. But when you got people pl playing with you like this, you don't need a symphony. This is the theme from Splendor in the Grass. I'm going to do just a very short version with a wonderful bass player, Ron Bland, and so the people who've seen the movie can hear the way it was done originally, not in such a nice studio as this one. I played it in Kazan's place and then in my little one-room apartment on 6th Avenue so he could hear what I had in mind.
That was beautiful. That was that was beautiful. You know, one of the uh, one of the things sometimes when you're you, you know you're uh, you're in your house and and uh, the TV's on or the radio's on or something and you hear a melody, you go, oh yeah, you, you automatically know what it is. You know, the the, the uh, splendor in the grass or the Manchurian Candidate or you know any of those iconic. Uh, 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 the music that you wrote for for those films have, have always uh, have always stood out for a oh, long thank time. You. Well, you know, it's funny when I wrote those. That was 1960, a few weeks ago. The Manchurian Candidate <laughs> in 1962. The reaction from the intelligentsia of that period was, "It does sound like movie music." I said, "It's not music, movie music. It's music." For a movie, and I said, scoring a film is an art, just like writing a ballet or playing in the band, or cooking a good meal, or doing anything where you try to do a good job and collaborate with others to achieve something that you couldn't do all by yourself. And I love doing it. When finally, and for those listeners who might have a few rejection slips, this was all when I was still in my late twenties, and. The last few years, they've put out 60 years of my some of the music I've done for films, which is in a five-CD box set by a tiny little publisher in London who also put out, put out my the country where my books are all issued now. And suddenly they've come out. So at this point, as a 93-year-old teenager, I'm <laughs> being <laughs> discovered for what I wrote. That don't sound like movie music. But it was really some nice music. The very first one I did was Cecil Taylor playing piano on his first recording in 1956 for a documentary film. And I had that song with Buster Bailey and so many extraordinary jazz artists and classical artists. And uh, the person whom I worked for loved music, and all of us were brought up hearing one of the great giants who showed us that there's life beyond uh, the Chitlins and Cuchifrito circuit where we all played because that was the best places we could get to play in and that those were magical places where great, great artistic music was created but that it can go on and on and now he's considered, he's revered to be one of the, along with Thelonious Monk, considered to be one of our box of American music. His name was Charles Parker. And when I met Hugh Reagan in 1968, and you're just finishing high school, I was doing, doing a program with the wonderful Houston Symphony where we played classical pieces I'd written on the first half and jazz on the second half. And there wasn't any antipathy or bad feelings for the handful of people that showed up. We all had a good time because we were having a good time and playing the best music we could do. And this is one of the people who encouraged everybody. And I was just lucky, as I've been all my life, to meet him and, and jam with him and be mentored. And his name was Charles Parker. And what he created in terms of his playing is something now that's in every school and being studied all over the world. And at, he struggled during his lifetime just to have what he did appreciated, and then it took another 20 or 30 years for it to finally enter into the halls of academe where you could actually study it and see, man, like Mozart, he never played or wrote a bum note. So he set a high standard for all of us as a person, as a sharing musician, as a great artist, and talk about an inspiration. That was the man. So this is one of his famous pieces, and also for those fans of Kuvo, if you don't play the blues, you're sure not fulfilling what your function is <laughs> as, a, as a living musician, especially if you're brought up in this country where we're saturated, whether we know it or not, with not only with the musical form, but with the philosophy and the cultures, many cultures, 
that the blues came from and still come from.
if you should know that you're tuned into the right radio if you listen to W Kuvo. That's really all you have to ever think or understand to hear the hymns broadcasting in the land. They've won so many awards and each one is justly given to them because of what they do for all of us. So in order to hear the music, you don't have to join a band and travel all over the USA practically working for nothing and sitting in the very back of the bus. You could just turn on the radio and hear the best music every day. Because that's what's known as the Kuvo way. So jazz is good for you. It helps out every part of your life. It makes you a better son and daughter and certainly a better husband or wife. So if you want to think and still progressively and celebrate your own creativity. Just remember Charlie Parker and his message to us, which was, don't forget about spontaneously. From the Bon Fee Staten Performance Studio at KUVO Radio, you've been listening to David Amram and friends, including Ron Bland on drums, Tony um, Ron Bland on bass, Tony Black on drums, Adam Amram on congas, and uh, the the master on trumpet, Mr. Hugh Reagan, and of yes. course the Renaissance man of American music, Mr. David Amram. As a composer, I can't express my gratitude to all of you, the Kuvo listeners, all the wonderful players who are with us, Ron Bland and Tony Black, Adam Amram and Hugh Reagan, and you, Carlos, and everyone at Kuvo, for all you've done for good music built to last, because it's all beautiful, and if it's sincere, it comes from the heart, it's classical and worthy, it stands the test of time because it's beautiful and it stays beautiful. And that's what has made my life a lot more meaningful, and I hope I can share some of those blessings with others. Thank you, David. Thank you for being here today. Appreciate it. Yeah. We are in the Bonfi Staten Performance uh, Studio uh, with uh, David Amram and... Uh, author and editor of David's uh, new book, The Many Worlds of David Amram, The Renaissance Man of American Music, Mr. Dean Birkenkamp. Welcome to uh, KUVO uh, Radio here in, in Denver. Congratulations on the, on the new uh, volume of, of, you, of the book. Yeah, you're most welcome. You know, the, 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 the cool part about the, the, the book as you point out in, 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 in the opening in, in going through this, uh, many of us know, uh, you know, about David's career and, and spanning all, all the years and everybody who he's worked with. There's nobody on the planet who even comes close to uh, being able to uh, relate to music the way Senor Amram does. Just from the experiences he's had, you know, in the life that, he, that he's led, did you have this idea, David, that um, uh, Dean rather, that uh, y you wanted to to get some of the people that have been touched by David over the years uh, to maybe lend a little bit of insight into uh, the man and his music, so to speak? Because there's some wonderful stories in here. If you could just give us a, a synopsis about 
what the book is is about. Yeah, well, the book started when David was staying at our home about four years ago, and I was talking about how he's touched so many different genres of music and, and arts beyond music. And so, you know, I could, a lot of people might know him in two or three of them, but they don't know him in nine or ten genres, at least, that he's touched. And so I thought there needs to be a book that attempts to put together a view of that. And, and I engaged other writers who have worked with David over the years. So the essays are by famous conductors, uh, opera singers, film directors, actors, novelists, uh, and great musicians, including Grammy-winning musicians in jazz and, and in the orchestral world. And so the book is the first attempt to give a really more comprehensive view of David in all of his many uh, permutations as a musical artist. Uh, and in many ways, the book is kind of like David. It's, a, it's kind of a history of culture and arts in America since World War II. Yeah, yeah. And obviously covering, you know, like you said, all the genres, uh, there are stories in here uh, behind the, you know, the, the aspect of the chamber music, the classical music, the Native American uh, uh, music is really, really uh, fascinating from the standpoint yeah. when you when you find out. And I've and I've heard this before and it's and it's and it's documented here in the book, David, where they we talk about um the uh, improvisational nature of Native American music. If you listen to the, the, the Native American music, you learn something about uh, improv. You learn something about being in, in, uh, in the moment. And it, it starts by listening mm -hmm. first and, 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 uh, and foremost. Uh, you know, those of us on the jazz side and on the Afro-Caribbean side of the music and so forth, as you were pointing out, Dean, uh, you know that that's where we live, and we understand that uh, the, the the movie scores uh, is kind of like a, a, to me. It's kind of like okay, this is a ground where where people can really appreciate what uh, what uh, what you've done, uh, David, in terms of your musical scores and so forth. But my goodness, you you don't ever seem to. To, to, to you know it's like the, wherever the music takes you that's where you live exactly. in that in, in that moment you know and and the stories are are, are, are remarkable uh, in here so congratulations thank you I'm pulling that together and everything and what's your f favorite part of this this book well when Dean wrote what they called the table of contents uh-huh I thought of all the incre <laughs> incredible variety of people that I thought, might be able to write something. And it never occurred to me, wait a minute, this has to be organized so it could be a book with a nice cover, which Chris Felber took yeah. took a picture of me yeah. when, yeah. His, when I was making a record in Louisville with some poets. And he was there and he said, I'll take a picture, man. He said, put your finger up and took the picture. <laughs> uh, but when I saw the table of contents, and then saw the picture, mm -hmm. and then figured, Dean helping to figure out a title. Suddenly, what seemed to be just fl floating <laughs> through, through the wonderful life I've been fortunate enough to live, right. a whole bunch of stuff, putting it together, and I looked at that table of contents and said, man, the way it's organized, it actually looks like it was meant to be or it was planned hmm. so that the poor reader would have a chance to read it without saying, what, what? It, it, he'd lay, so I said, you have to be the author. I said, you've, you've done work four years doing this. You've done all the work. I just got to help, help you to get in touch with some of the people. Yeah. But you figure out how to do it and how to make it into a book. I've written three books for Dean, and he was an enormous help yeah. in yeah. editing and giving me a few suggestions which made so much sense and it's good to have someone who you can work with in anything that can either give you advice or if you don't need advice, just say, go ahead and keep on doing it. 
Yeah. Both, both are invaluable. Yeah, yeah. The help is encouragement and the help that you really need. That, that's the kind of criticism we all could use. Well, I remember the book Nine Lies of a Musical Cat yeah. was to me one of the most entertaining and, and uh, you know, books. interestingly yeah. enough, that was a book that was that was the book Vibrations originally that I was going to write in nineteen sixty in the sixties. And the editor, Alan Rinsler, who was brilliant, said, You know, your philosophy of the nine lives is interesting. <laughs> But nobody could relate to that. But the stories that you tell yeah. are terrific. So cut out the stories, arrange that chronologically, right. and go from there. So I took everything I could remember from 1936 when I was a six-year-old up until <laughs> I finished the book, wrote down the date, and things that were really interesting, put those underneath, slapped the stories in between, and actually created the whole book. But then... What the Dying Lives of a Musical Cat turned out to be was an idea that I had 30 years before that that never would have made a book in itself. And it finally came to be one because I had some idea of how to organize it. But Dean took something that I never even thought, I had no idea what it was going to be, yeah. sort of a jumble, and um, helped to make a book out of it. So I thought he should yeah. be the author, and yeah. I did the right thing because he was. Well, Dean, one of the, the in the section on the back of the book, where uh, every uh, everything that uh, his discography and the compositions, the list of, of everything, all in there, the symphonic music compositions, all the way, you know, just all the way through, it's just amazing. I don't, have you has that ever been put together in one one place like that? Uh, you got the selected apart, album. Apart from David's website, the discography had never been formally published right. before, I believe. Right. right. Is that correct? No. Every, what, what you did, Dean, was to make it possible for some 15-year-old that will never meet to say, gee, I'd like to do something. That guy's in the 90s. He's doing a lot of things and having a good time doing it and grateful, grateful to be doing it. So it, it gives a chance for somebody, hopefully, to see what has been done, where it came from, and then figure out how to do something themselves. Yeah. I think we suffer largely from being told from the yeah. time we're six years old, no offense, but you suck. <laughs> so <laughs> by the time you you get your third rejection slip, you you assume, you know, that's, I guess... The experts all tell me to give up. When I was, yeah. very briefly, when I was uh, 10 years old, I was sitting on the tractor. And my father gave me seven acres just for me to take care of, to grow soybeans and do a lot of stuff. And he said, well, David, you're doing a good job. He said, milk the cow and you're doing the great. He said, what do you want to do when you grow up? I said, I want to be a farmer like you. And he said, I can't be a farmer full time. I have to have my other work too. And he said, you're never going to be able to make it on a 160-acre farm anymore. This was not at the end of the Depression, a long time ago. He already saw what the agricultural scene was becoming. And uh, if you don't have another job. So he said, what else would you like to be? I said, a classical composer and a jazz musician. <laughs> he paused and he said, that's worse. <laughs> I said... Oh, so, but he supported my career death wishes to the max yeah. and said, you know, whatever you want to do, just work hard, do the yeah. best you can. Well, if that's what you feel you were put here to do, go for it yeah. and hope for the best. <laughs> Dean, you've, uh, you've been in the publishing business for a long time, and uh, I know you met David uh, here, I believe. Was it here uh, in, in Boulder in, in my in house Boulder, about yeah. 20 years ago? About yeah. 20 years back and so forth. And now the, the, the book is, is out currently? Yes. The book is out. How's it been received? What kind of feedback are well, you Well, we've had five or six reviews, and they've all yeah. been very positive. Several yeah. of them have been from England, yeah. interestingly enough. Yeah. And uh, I know that the New York City Jazz Record plans a, a, a review of it. Yeah. But but I think people have liked the tremendous breadth and the detail, the stories that are in the book. Yes, yeah, yeah. 
I like the, uh, in particular, the the story. From, I believe it's from uh, uh, Woody Guthrie's daughter. Yeah. Yes. About how this came about, the the, the variations, the symphonic variations of Woody Guthrie, or variations of of Woody Guthrie, and when we're, I think the first time that uh, it was finally performed was in San Antonio, and so forth, and how she thought about you, you know, to to do this with with Woody's. You know, with, with it was, it was just a wonderful thrill, and it got recorded by the Denver Symphony Orchestra. Also, yes, yeah. A and fortunately, the we have some copies here which we can give to the station. And the yeah. Kuvo engineer, the jazz engineers, yeah. were the ones who helped help me to mix it. Yeah, for, from Kuvo. I remember that. Remember those Thank days. And that's yes. thanks to you that they came. Yeah. Rather than sending in some people who said, "Well." We never heard of the guy, and, and we, he's doesn't, we're not formally associated with the symphony, so let's right. cr crank it out. Right, right. And it sounded much better, and I, I was able to actually have it sound the way it sounded when I was conducting it, because that's the best seat in the house is being on the podium. You can hear everything yeah. and everybody. And and uh, some of the people who, who worked on that concert also wrote for the wrote for the book. Right. Hugh Reagan and, and uh, Barry Allman, who was the MC that right, night. Right, right. And it was really, and, and Nora, of course, and it was so nice to, to uh, see that come to fruition. And like everything else in my life, just like the record I signed with the Manchurian Candidate score, that took 50 years to come out. But for the person I signed it for and people who listened to it, it's what Pete Hamill described when they said, Pete, just before he died, they said, what advice have you got for young authors? He said, read. He said, read the classics. He said, Madame Bovary is a brand new book until you open it up. I said, wow. So the idea is that a thing of beauty is a joy forever. And if it's good, it might take a um, year, two years, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, but it'll come out there and it'll sell itself yeah. and be on its own because it'll have a place because it's saying something. And, and of course, that's not a point of view that you can sell to a business world generally yeah. because they, they figure, ah, it's some new age hustler hide the silverware. <laughs> They're coming to visit us, you know. Yeah. So that's not that's just something you have to live and believe in, and the way you have to behave, yeah. and you have a much better life, I think, doing that. Yeah, meet right. nicer people, keep your old friends, and I can, enjoy, and your family and everything else. Yeah, Dean, the book is available on all the the uh, the usual places: Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com, yeah. and. Uh, and as an ebook, as an ebook and a paperback, yes. Uh, oh, also, yeah. Oh, okay, the Renaissance Man of American Music, edited and introduced by Dean Birkenkamp, Mr. Amram, Senor Amram. <laughs> thank you so much, man, for for being here. You're back in Denver, Carlos. You're back I in thank Colorado. you for all your years yeah. since 1990. Yeah, when we first met at Cuvo, way off. That's yeah. quite a few months ago. Yeah. 20, 20, <laughs> what, what, 30? Uh, he's always so much in the moment, he calls it months, man. They're supposed to be years, but no, they're months. <laughs> yeah. They're months. Yeah, that was yeah, 1990. That's 35 yeah. years ago. Back in the day, man, Rico and all the guys. Oh, sure, man. I was still here. Yeah. Yeah, those were some times, man. Those were some times. I wish you the best, man. And, and likewise, and thank you for everything you've done to thank keep, you for all keep you the do music alive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, special thanks to the Bonfee Stanton Foundation, Drum City Guitar Land in Wheat Ridge, owned and operated and staffed by working musicians since 1965, Grace Design Pro Audio in Lyons, Colorado, and donors to the Carlos Lando Musician and Event Fund, and with support uh, from um, engineer sound engineer, broadcast engineer, Klaus Larsen, and video production by Alec Kennefick.